It ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Just because someone stumbles, loses their way, it doesn't mean they're lost forever. Does it get easier? No. The more you know who you are and what you want, the less you let things upset you. You can do it! You can do it! You can do it! Hear ye, hear ye. Doth travelled far and wide for a spectacle, and a showeth we shall giveth. Gather round for this decade's first edition of Nick's Nonfiction, hosted by a vibrant, capable young open micer, Nick Muniz. Next year, that is going to be a standing ovation for all of the newcomers you have just stumbled upon the best thing to ever happen to your life. This is a video podcast revolution. We got soundboards, new microphones, zingers, knee slappers, intros, outros, gifs, jpegs, books, nooks, snozberries, gobstoppers. It's a whole new show if you go back 365 days ago. I cannot wait to look down on myself 365 days from now, dropping season three. But welcome all. How would we describe this show to the newcomers? It's a podcast. It's a video. It's an education. It's a vibe. It's a user-based interface smartphone application. Maybe not the last one. It's... It's... It is a dimension that lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. Welcome newcomers, old comers, and all comers to Nick's Nonfiction here with your host, Nick Muniz. We got tons of new books this year, and as you may have heard, we are going by monthly ladies and gentlemen. In this corner of the internet, we read the apex of human literature and splatter half-baked jokes on top of it. Every month is a new topic corresponding to the theme of that month. Keep it festive for you. Next month, February, we're doing a book on romance, March, National Women's Month. Got you ladies covered. April, we are hitting the road with one of the biggest rock bands in the country. Cutting edge technological advancements, archaic bureaucracies that steal our money, everything you are used to here on the show, and we are ramping it up even harder for 2020. It's going to be a year of growth and content dropping two videos a month for y'all. We are going to be getting down to the dirty, the nitty gritty right off the bat from now on. If you remember the ancient archaic days of the 2010s, you've got mail. On this show, we used to do a news segment this past month on the top of the show. Scrapped it. It is now part of our 15th of the month, where we are going to be doing all types of news segments. Next month, we are breaking the cardinal rule of Nick's nonfiction. I am debriefing a fiction book for us. It's one of the coolest concepts, a book recommended by Stephen King. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. All types of experiments coming up this year. We're doing... Yelp review reviews. We're doing convincing customer service. We got some bits up the sleeves that we're going to try to throw around on the YouTube page. Get a little crazy with it. We are going to start this year off right with a self-help book that is very far from contrived. This Harvard ex-psychologist who still currently practices, at this point a world icon, touring and giving his speeches as a beacon of hope for young men everywhere, internationally, championing personal responsibility, not tearing down the system. It's biblical allegories about climbing your hierarchies. Jordan B. Peterson has an almost 40-year career diagnosing minds, and he condensed all of this knowledge into the best 12 steps you can take in order to put your life in a proper balance of order and chaos. So let's hit this about the author, the first of the new year. Jordan B. Peterson, he was born in 1962, now a 57-year-old man, has a family and very accomplished children, one girl, one boy. The girl has been on the freaking Joe Rogan show. That's, any parent would be proud of their kid that could do that shit. It's the biggest platform in media. And Jordan himself is a favorite, a recurring guest, an unlockable character 
on that show. He's a very, very educated man. Started off in McGill University up in Canada. He's a Canadian, not going to be running for president, so get your dirty, grubby politics out of my show. <laughs> and then went to Harvard. He knows our culture very well. Later in the book, he almost denounces his Canadian ship, saying he feels more American. And he taught for the longest time at the University of Toronto. This is where Jordan got in trouble for dunking on all of the underdeveloped liberal minds at his school. He's still considered like a uh, alternative right and alt-right wing devil. Are we still doing that shit in 2020? Antifa versus alt-right. I think everybody in the world by now is looking up, which is the point. Donald Trump was not a local event. There are revolutions all over the world right now. But Jordan admits, even in his lectures now, I was listening to a couple of his podcasts in preparation, and he admits regret, saying what he does now, touring around the world and t talking to hundreds of young men, and you see all these pictures online, sometimes he's like, let the man fucking go home. He's in an airport. You don't need a picture there. <laughs> I'd probably do the same thing. But the exposure he has now... He's going, I probably should have just let the little girls preaching the third wave of feminism, which we are going to be covering in depth in March. He's going, that's in the past. Can we move on, people? But there's no, <laughs> in the media world, they can drag your name through the muck forever. Remember Upton Clinsair and the muck raking? That's not a thing of the past. Now it's like muck sludging. Nickelodeon Double Dare 2000, you're getting slimed tonight. You're getting muck raked for the rest of your life. Me Too means your career is over forever. Louis C.K. never stepped foot in a comedy club again. Did he do his time out? Is that what this is, or is he, you trying to ruin people? Jordan identifies as a classic British liberal. Okay, we don't even have a name for liberal anymore. It's not anti-war. It's not even free speech. The liberals, they're the ones that are trying to say you can't say faggot. It's 2020. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> the rules reversed when the decades flipped. You guys didn't hear? Well, it, big in Jordan's lectures, he talks about how we are in a period of postmodernism. All the big philosophers were talking about this freaking Dostoevsky. He quotes a decent amount of Nietzsche, but he says that that guy's a freaking mind virus and he'll make you go negative forever. All types of depth to today's show. Jordan got his rise. He was like an keyboard warrior he was known on quora forums this was like before everybody's on reddit now reddit's now mainstream and it's literally a news publisher it's like how facebook and youtube are trying to become networks now if you are curating news and picking stories or saying what has to be banned it's just reverse curating then you are no longer a platform you are a fucking news publisher you're like the new york times and you're just trying to say you're a free speech platform did we forget about free speech Yo, they just friggin' re-signed the Patriot Act under our nose. Free speech. Throw it out the window, along with privacy. And so Jordan has been building a following online since the beginning, and his podcast now has 1.8 million average downloads. And his YouTube videos are accumulating over like 60 million. So in March, he sold off his podcast to the Westwood One Network with Jordan Peterson's daughter, and as a ho-host, co-host, ho-host, ho, she's hoeing around on the podcast, co-host on some episodes. If you've ever seen any of the old Jordan B. Peterson ones, the guy sounds exactly like Kermit the Frog. So he'd be like in his friggin' room, which was just covered in books because he's a friggin' professor, and he had a friggin' Kermit the Frog on his hand, and he's like, hmm, clean up your room. Is that how Carmen sounds? He's telling you to get your shit together with a puppet on his hand <laughs> to one and a half million people. And he's like, I don't need to be editing audio anymore. And he sold his show off to the network. You've seen a lot more happening this in the developing media landscape. New decade. In 2012, the average American poll, it was like 28% of Americans were listening to podcasts. Now it's at 70. It's a new decade, ladies and gentlemen. Move over, old heads. Nick's nonfiction's on the way. Jordan published one of his first essays as well as a book. That one's called Maps of Meaning. But 12 Rules of Life here, always curating the best for us. It's translated into dozens, probably more than that, languages, and is a still eye-level, top-shelf book in hundreds of countries around the globe. I've seen pictures of it in Taiwanese, like alien letters. <laughs> So there's 12 rules, a preface, and a coda at the end, which is like the dun, the crescendo, like those trumpets we had to start out today. 
you'll get a little feel of how the book is going to be here in the preface. And it does touch on religion a good amount just because it's based on the Bible. But if you have found this show on the internet, you are you have an open enough mind where you know the Bible isn't just ghost stories. It's not like a Goosebumps compilation. Every detail is important because if it wasn't important, then people wouldn't pass on that detail. It was a verbal story like the Odyssey. It's a little layered fables that teach you about the triumphs of man. The Bible also, you're not going to open it and Casper the ghost isn't going to float out. The Bible's not just like a list of rules. It's traditions that are supposed to keep you safe. The reason for um kosher thing, like Jesus was a Jew. The reason for kosher is that mixing like uh, pork and lettuce gave these motherfuckers salmonella and they didn't have germ theory nobody knew where that was coming from so they were like god hates it when we put ham on the same counter as the leaves we gotta stop moisha's convulsing on the ground over there from it and the thing like you can't wear two cloths the sabbath that was because uh i don't want to get political but there were kings that were buying off local merchants cloth at that point some strings being pulled in the bible there but what gets passed down is most important what jordan has picked to talk about is obviously pertinent to fixing your life so the opening anecdote for the preface jordan chose to use was moses commenting on the ten commandments saying ideologies are ideas disguised as science or philosophies but if you're relying on an ideology to fix yourself like the tony robbins method or whatever say yes to the universe those aren't rules or tangible steps that you can follow to create more order in your life (laughs) it's not i'm trying to tell you it's not um you're a badass corny motivation type of things dude's gonna go down as a freaking modern philosopher and so jordan interprets this moses quote saying how ideology is a substitute for knowledge so like if i don't want to like the flat earth people, dude, they have an ideology. They're, I, I, <laughs> it's that we live on a fucking pancake. And they're using that to negate data, knowledge, like uh, measurable facts that are in mass accepted to be true. So they're not going off knowledge. Tying your identity to anybody's ideology is going to get you wrapped up in a situation where you're defending something stupid. Like being the only planet in a solar system that was squished under a rolling pin. And JBP Jordan takes his first shot at another philosopher. He's trying to level himself up, get himself in that hierarchy. And he goes, Aristotle said that virtue is acting in the way that'll make you most happy in life. All of the fucking philosophers shit on Aristotle. They were like, go get back to your telescope, (laughs) little science boy. Put your lab coat on. Leave the thinking to us trippers. And Jordan says virtues should aim for balance and minimize the vices. So, no. Virtue isn't acting what's going to make you most happy to dance around and fall asleep drooling with a smile on your face. Virtues should minimize vices and aim for balance, which he gets into later is basically responsibility. A lot of scientific tests how chemicals, food, drugs make you happy in the short term, but taking on responsibility makes your life better. And so we're already talking about monitoring your vices. It's the new year. This is when people all, what are those called? Resolutions? Sure. New year, new new me. The calendar's changed. My entire identity is different. Big things coming. Why do people say shit like this and put it out into the universe? Probably because they want it to be heard and then hopefully come true. But in all of the deepest part of our psyches, we all want to be judged. It's going to be a big theme throughout the show. This dude spent his whole life outside of work on Quora, reading other people's thoughts and spending his work time in psychological sessions. Look at fucking Wise Bar and uh, Soul Cycle, all this shit so big. People do group fitness because they know they are being judged by their most attractive peers. It helps you. If you don't reach for your goals, you're going to feel as though you have no fucking meaning. It's just like the responsibility thing. So the lower you are on the ladder or in your hierarchy to reaching your goals, the more impulsive people still generally are, which is the hardest part. (laughs) It's like the earlier level in the video games are the harder ones until you get the right weapons and then you can start cruising. So what we have to remember moving forward, Jordan's talking the world of the forms a little bit here. I still have some Play-Doh residual on my brain from last month. The state of the world is order and chaos. It's not material items. Order is a good way to map out your life, not if you have a car or if you own a house yet. 
And it's a good way to reduce your fucking anxiety if you, like, write your goals out. Jordan's saying, he's dealt with the biggest nuts ever. It's a great way to reduce your anxiety. Write the shit down. See what you're actually trying to do. Organize your thoughts. So in the preface here, Jordan has seen a million different mindscapes as a psychiatrist, and he knows humans are not born equal. Sorry. I think you could be put in a fucking FEMA internment camp for saying that in this new decade. Or a Boston Dynamics robot is going to show up at my house, a drone with a gun outside my window. So since everybody's not equal, there is a dominance hierarchy. Look outside. The trees in your backyard. One's taller than the other ones. He's getting more nutrients. So capitalism is a fair game for humans due to the fact that we don't start equal, whereas socialism, by definition, is unfair, by definition, because then you would have to make everyone equal to the weakest link. Whereas markets rise people up, like capitalism, you'd have to fucking kneecap everybody to use the handicap bathrooms if we're talking socialist. It's egalitarianism versus equity. <laughs> are we looking to have a fair game, or are we looking to all go home with a participation trophy because then one is a fucking staged event and one is an actual competition then and literally dude look at soviet russia the entire thing was a staged event look at america capitalism there's some hairy shit going down with jeffrey epstein and clintons and all that but at least i'm allowed to hopefully rise an economic class above my ancestors there is class mobility whereas there's none of that shit if we're talking socialism Jordan has to shit on himself a little bit here to defend all the demented people that he helped. Jordan and his daughter both have a genetic autoimmune disease, which is where your body fights itself thinking itself as an intruder, like cancer. So he was able to cure it through a carnivore diet. He just tried everything. And look at him from five years ago. And look at him today. He looks like um, Ken, Barbie and Ken, a fucking action figure. <laughs> Why did I... I think about Barbie all the time. <laughs> He, like, transformed his fucking skin. <laughs> Calling him Jesus, he cures lepers. <laughs> but through that, and he said hyperglycema as well, he learned the importance of your body as an orchestra and how a lot of people don't know how to conduct the orchestra that is their body. They just get the little hit stick, tick, 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 and then just throw it at the tuba guy in the back. So it is uneven. But to give us some hope before we start, he quotes Price's Law, which is, those who start to have will probably have more. So when you start to succeed, it actually does turn on a brain mechanism where you need to have that reward filled again. But just as a general superstitious law, you see people that get lucky from time to time or just have that energy flowing. The universe gives it back to them. They get more lucky. There's a lot of potential within chaos that you could turn into habitable order. So that's going to lead us into rule one. Stand up tall. Jordan says, stand up straight with your shoulders back. Unless you have a grade 5 AC shoulder joint separation where your clavicle is sticking outside of your trap muscle. <laughs> or leaving the motorcycle brain damage in 2019. Jordan starts talking about lobsters. He's known as the lobster king, baby. Lobsters and territory. Just like any animal. They're ugly. But us and lobsters have the exact same interpersonal behaviors. Jordan had a story of him and his dad building a birdhouse, and the first birds they saw show up, his dad told them were the males. But they weren't much larger than the other ones that were starting to come. But they, like, positioned themselves like a security guard in front of the hole, the birdhouse hole, and didn't let any of the other males in. They only let women in. It was a really good bouncer. He was charging fives for guys. And from the age of, like, four, Jordan's saying he realizes there's a pecking order. Or when he was studying the lobsters in his grad program, yada yada, he realized they have a feeding order. Why would men be any different? We're part of nature, are we not? There are hierarchies that separate us. A couple studies he mentioned, they did brain scans of lobsters. Didn't think they had brains. It's going to be a microscopic machine for those dumbasses. They scanned dogs as well and found out that when either animal loses a fight for turf or even worse, when it was in a social setting, the reaction of the brain set up a literal defense mechanism. Serotonin dropped out of the brain, and the lobsters will start to turn gray and shit. In humans, that's what we're saying here. If you're having this loser mentality, you're going to start to slouch over. There's actual physiological differences you can see in people who aren't taking control of their own shit. 
And Jordan was had the <laughs> pleasure to give a lobster Prozac. It's pretty dope. Give the little guy a ha- the happiest day of his shell-filled life. And when they had all of that serotonin running through their lobster brain, they would actually grow in size. So it's that winning positive feedback loop that actually made the lobsters bigger in physical stature and able to nab up more lobster tail. Oh! <laughs> Can I get something from the audience for that one? Get out of here. New live studio audience. Two weeks from now. I'm going to sell bed tickets. <laughs> And Jordan found out even though lobsters are solitary creatures, when they started bringing it up the food chain, they got to like wolves and shit and realized when one animal is sad or a loser just lost a fight to a rival gang, it like spreads. And what they were able to see in humans was vets with PTSD, their anxiety infects the entire family structure. And Jordan had what was called agoraphobia, I think it was, which is like the motherly the natural motherly anxiety unfiltered put into the baby. Some shit like that where the mom was just freaking out, like the Donald Trump moms I was talking about who can't hold it together last month. That uneasy aura in the household is easily detectable by even babies. They know that some shit's not up and that anxiety gets passed on from generation to generation. And it does go the other way with positivity, with the wolves and with the people. Female lobsters become uncontrollably obsessed with the top lobster so they get happy too when there's a guy that's kicking ass it's awesome to see somebody winning hashtag winning we're gonna be sick and tired of winning (laughs) that's a great line dude (laughs) the girl lobsters don't have to gossip about who has the best claws the dominance hierarchy naturally decides for them just like just like women do dave you got more money you're gonna pick a better trophy wife or whatever it, these things exist. Am I a misogynist for having just said that? Fuck no, man. I'm just talking. And when those chick lobsters are really randy, they start spraying pheromones all around the big lobsters. You know, dropping nudies in the king's DMs. But think about, like, defending the point here. Beauty and the Beast, Cinderella, you got 50 shades of gray, was the biggest thing to ever happen for women. That innate want to have a millionaire or a king, a prince in Cinderella's case, or a literal beast take care of you. It's in our nature. Lobsters have been around for 350 million years, and they have been ingraining this hierarchy system into our DNA. We all started in the ocean. This is a part of us. You cannot just call for a safe space. There's going to be someone who's running the safe space, the top chimp by the end of the day. This is why Jordan got so revved up. He was trying to tell these points to college kids. It's not going to work. Everybody's equal in your RSO, Registered Student Organization. Ask a feminist, there's not a lot of romance novels about poor guys. Yo! (laughs) We're going to do a a porno book. uh, What are those even called? Erotic novel for uh, Nick's nonfiction here. It's going to have to be a bonus. (laughs) Wrapping up the first rule here about standing tall. You can see it's all about this positive feedback loop. There's what's called the principle of unequal distribution. There's all this fancy professor jargon that Jordan tries to expedite with more memorable, cooler terms. The principle of unequal distribution. Jordan just calls the nature of nature. Unequal distribution. That's what I'm saying. Nobody's born equal. Go outside. Everybody has a different car. What around you screams we're all equal? Your kindergarten teacher? Maybe you should grow up a little bit. (laughs) Jordan referenced just a normal-ass graph with the y equals mxb curve going straight up. And the two indicators x by axis was resources and productivity. So the more you work, the more you have... The more you're, I just bought a car. Now when I'm not doing anything on the weekends and I need to not be reading for a little bit, I could go drive DoorDash. My resources are going up exponentially now. It's bullshit. Nobody helps you at the beginning. The the earlier levels are the hardest, he's saying. So rather than slouching and uh, not getting out of your bed all day or not working or whatever, standing up tall, looking people in the eye, it's a positive feedback loop. I like the quote. I've definitely said it on the show before. There is no reality. There's only perception. How you represent your physique is the first impression, the first look, the first chance any stranger's lobster brain is going to have to judge and categorize you. 
everybody just, ooh, I'm going to put you in this little box so I know what you're up to. That's all people want to fucking do. So stand up tall. Give them the best image that you can. Be the fucking tallest lobster on your block. Stand up on your le- your hind four out of 40 legs. Yummy little buggers. So Jordan's all about incremental changes. None of these 12 rules are going to be get sober immediately. He's saying stand up tall and you're going to realize the big chungus energy is going to be flowing back towards you. I have trademarked this term. I've been saying it on stage for a year now. Big chungus energy. That is the copyright of Nick Muniz. If you use a meme with big chungus energy, I want to see the hairy shit watermark on that. Jordan says standing straight is a ready position. You're accepting the burden of being, the nature of nature, the burden of being. It's a beast to be on this earth. If your shoulders are up, back, and dropped, you are in a mental state of readiness. Jordan says dare to be dangerous. Encourage the serotonin to flow plentifully through the neural pathways despite the calm influence. And if you're always standing tall, you're not going to need a crutch in the hard times. People will start to assume that you are competent. Look at the 350 million years of wisdom and genetic information being passed down from the lobsters. Stand straight with your shoulders back. Rule two, treat yourself like someone you're responsible for helping. If you treat your body like a landfill, it's going to look like that by the time genetics catch up with you. Jordan was a behavioral psychiatrist. This is like the top of his hierarchy. This is not a therapist, someone you just go talk out your ass to. Jordan has this saying later how therapy is basically just coddling if you don't enact behavioral change. You're just going there and airing out your grievances without changing. No, you gotta fucking enact something. So he is a behavioral psychiatrist. And then psychiatrist is just like a level above psychology. (laughs) But you could sling sedatives. You could prescribe people shit. So he gives people behavioral adjustments to recover. And then he's trusted enough to prescribe a tiny bits, he says, when he's when is needed. And so he knows about the prescription landscape. And he dropped a cool fact here in the treat yourself like someone you're responsible for helping rule too. One third of prescriptions are never filled. <laughs> so a third of the psychopaths are running around off their meds right now. However, people fill their pets prescriptions at 100% rate. People take more care of their pets and their kids than they do themselves. Which, what are you going to do? Your kid's going to draw a better picture in kindergarten the next day? Maybe you should put a fucking steak on the table for him to grow bigger in his mind to adjust. You got to treat yourself like the kid. And he's also saying, in order to help yourself, you got to know your own instincts and know when to trust them. The more in tune you get with your body... You realize the slower that you're responding, the more thought you're putting into something and the less committed you want to be. Instincts, Jordan says, manifest themselves in long release emotions. So that could play out over days, weeks, months, or years like a breakup. It'll hit people at a bunch of different speeds. But one of the studies I read, uh, Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, Blink, I just wiped my face when I said that. It was all about precognition, and it was about Malcolm Gladwell loves shitting on white people. He's going, cops, when they see a black person, their hand is already on the trigger. May be true, but precognition is true. You already know whether you want to do something. There is apparently a one-third lead your brain has on your body before you respond. So you got to try to tune into that and see whether it is your bitch brain trying to bitch you out of a new adventure someone's inviting you on or if it's keeping you safe. And talking about adventure... Give your Tinder a scroll, and I guarantee you, by the time you run out of swipes, you will see a girl saying she's looking for adventure on her dating profile. How about I pick you up tomorrow in my ski mask with my noose rope? Don't ask me why I have it. (laughs) No! No! Jordan has a stat here. Women say no. He, li- he was on the college campus. People were doing this for their uh, master's programs. Women say no 85% of the times on dating sites. Their instinct is no. Whereas if you watch one of your buddies swipe, it looks like he um, wipe a dry booger off his finger. He's going <laughs> fucking sending every single face to the right. Yes, 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 yes. 100% of the time. So there's only a 15% overlap of adventure there. To put it into words, you know that cute story that your grandma would tell you about how, oh, grandpa chased me all around town. 
<laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, is sexual assault nowadays. Pop Pops would have gotten me too His career would have been over and he would have been soiled in the public square of Twitter, Instagram. So it's just like, if you're hot enough to a girl, you won't be creepy. Just like the dating landscape is <laughs> trying to work that 15% out into order and chaos, which is uh, the suburbs, the married off, the wet and settled. And so rather than me riffing about dating apps, let's get one of these biblical allegories. And I was telling you that Jordan was peppering in the book, the Garden of Eden story. Adam and Eve giving you the super abridged version. They were not conscious. Bibles layered like lasagna. They're supposed to represent adolescence, Adam and Eve, while they are in the Garden of Eden. And then they get the apple of knowledge, which is supposed to be like... You're becoming self-conscious. You ate the apple. Women mature faster than men. That's why the girl ate the apple. Even though she <laughs> she stole Adam's rib. Bitch. As soon as she ate the apple, she got all of the knowledge and she was kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Because they were like, okay, your childhood's over. You have all the knowledge now. <laughs> now you see how much it sucks to fucking live. You gotta provide now. So maybe, Eve, did she, uh, the serpent... I've been hearing this recently, that that is supposed to be the symbol of truth throughout history. And the eagle is the symbol of surveillance it always was. I gotta read more into that type of fucking Anunnaki Sumerian bullshit before I drag you all down the hole. <laughs> Adam and Eve, you gotta treat yourself like you're someone responsible for helping for. Eve threw that to the wind. Or maybe she made them both smarter. You don't want to be stunted forever, you gotta mature. And so people love these stories. It's basically the same thing as Pinocchio. He wanted to get rid of his strings, and then he went out into the world, winds up in the belly of a whale. That's not fun. Or the Lion King, you're going to get trampled. <laughs> people like to see these stories through a different lens. This is why another dating profile, or when you're talking to a girl, she'll say, you need to open up to me more. She goes, I'm like the therapist for my friend group. Maybe you should start dealing with your own issues a little bit. People like these stories because it's just easier to fucking try to give someone else advice than looking in the mirror, which sucks dick. So if you never eat the apple, if you never look in the mirror, it's like the Oedipus nightmare. The mom stunted his growth, so then he was still sexually attracted to her, winds up stabbing his own eyes out. I think he killed her too in that one. Came back to bite her in the ass. So Jordan's point through those three myths is that it's better to render beings in your care competent rather than to try to protect them at every sign of danger. We're talking Bible. Give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. <laughs> when I was working at the supermarket, the EBT card guy, the food stamp people, come in eating fucking frog gua and creme brulee while I suck the skin off of an apple on my five minute break. Give him a job, not a supermarket sweep. Teach the man to fish. I learned this within my first year of supervising 40 motherfuckers in a coffee shop. There's a big difference between delegation and strong arming. When you're delegating, you're managing like a motherfucker, telling people they need to do their job. If you're strong arming, if you're tying Oeta Piss's shoes for him, it's gonna stunt them. And you, it's gonna drive you fucking crazy. So every single day, you gotta try to be a little bit better. You've heard that one? That's the definition of practicing excellence. Start teaching yourself to fish. Give yourself a skill. Do not go for a gender studies field hockey degree. <laughs> Jordan also brought up a good point about the Adam and Eve story I didn't even think about. As soon as they left the Garden of Eden, they started wearing clothes, which means they started covering up their ego. I was in a coffee shop today, and there was... The mom went to the bathroom, and this kid starts just like, he gets up because he was under watch the entire time trying to act like a civil being, but little kids are retarded, so am I. He starts walking around going, <laughs> and I was fucking dying. I literally put my hat over my face, and I was like, same man. A kid, someone who is still in the Garden of Eden, he has his innocence. He is not covering up his ego. If I walked around and went, <laughs> people would be like, what the fuck is wrong with this man? We need to call an ambulance. But in the perfect world, we wouldn't have to hide our egos. We wouldn't have to put our clothes on. Work on your body. You don't hide underneath the clothes. <laughs> so Jordan is a religious man himself. 
hold that in one part of your brain while we get into this. Jordan says heaven is something that you have to build internally. Immortality, though, is something that you have to earn. That's being remembered. Maybe there's an immortality club up in heaven, the VIP section, because heaven ain't that exclusive. I don't know if I want to get in that club where literally the hobo down the street is going to be in there. I have a little bit of savings. Can we do a 10K and above heaven? <laughs> or is that just Jewish heaven? And so heaven in the back of our mind, lower beings on our life form animals. They don't have like, they don't have a memory. They have a short term memory. If your dog smells you, he knows the smell and can relate it to, ooh, this person gives me food. But predators like your big cats have no knowledge of their weaknesses. That's why your cat will think he's stalking you around the room, but you know exactly where he is. Humans, we have marijuana and mirrors to tell us when we're getting fat. And so take the opposite of that statement. Heaven is something that you have internally. Hell is very much a place on earth if you could create that for yourself. The definition of evil is suffering for the sake of suffering. There's a whole lot of sadomasochists out there because people are putting themselves through some evil bullshit. Suffering for the sake of suffering, save some money. Did you need Disney Plus that bad? There goes another 150 bucks this year. It's worse than that. People do shit behaviors knowing that it's self-destructive, like uh, smoking ciggies. People know it's killing them, but <laughs> it's like that thing I was saying last month. Some people just give up. Whatevs, you do you. This is a DIY game we're all playing out here. And this is the end of the chapter here, basically. If you're doing these shit behaviors, like self-destructive behaviors, you're not treating yourself like somebody you're responsible for helping. <laughs> if um, you're legally responsible for the child that you bore, if you start feeding them cigarettes at the age of six, you're going to jail. But if you do it to yourself, luckily the state isn't throwing us in prison yet. But if you do crack, they will. So, oh, the state cares about you when there's enough money in the legal system to put you in a cage. Things fall apart. Jordan has seen this in all his psychiatry. It's, dude, it's lucky that around every single corner we're not met with adversity. Like the biological clock. Your, your body's a time bomb, bro. It's only a matter of time until one of your organs starts multiplying out of control. You get some cancer. Treat yourself like someone you're responsible for helping. So we're ending this one with the Nietzsche's quote already. Jordan quotes, He whose life has a why can bear almost any how. So, like I'm saying, write a goddamn goal down. That'll put a lot of sailing under your wings. Rule three, make friends with people who want the best for you. Jordan spent this entire chapter trashing his buddy who was clinging to weed as a pacifier instead of getting addicted to endorphins that are released when you get an achievement. So I got to do a little defense for the successful stoners. I am addicted to working out. <laughs> if I miss a day, I feel hungover. When I don't work out, I don't get that cocaine confidence boost. Not to mention the addictive neurochemicals, all of that serotonin and endorphins that my brain now relies on on a daily basis. Fucking, if I don't do that, I start itching my neck. Anything is a drug. Jordan says that everything humans do is addiction and habituation. So addict yourself to the right shit. Some people get high and eat mangoes. Some people drink a Coca-Cola and intravenous some mayonnaise. There are degrees to drug use and debauchery outside of what the government tells you and that your psychiatrist will be honest with you about. So Jordan, he grew up in a tiny blue-collar town in Canada, up in the tundra. He was seen as his town's little Einstein, and he would look at all the drunks in his town and realize, you know, I don't want to be like that. We are literally in an Arctic tundra. These drunkards are freezing to death in the street. He got to see some of that, and also in the town, the people who did smoke were stigmatized heavily. And now Canada is federally legalized interesting it's probably the same stigmas take hundreds of years to change jordan moves out of his small town to edmonton to school where he's living with his friend chris and their cousin they got an apartment there and obviously the cousin had a greater pull on chris being a family and he was pulling him in the wrong direction Jordan said they were drinking more, spending more money on drugs, and then he noticed Chris stopped playing the piano. So the guy ditched his ambition for drugs. He was not able to hold two concepts in his brain at once. Jordan said it like broke his fucking heart to see this. He made it out of his hometown. Do not travel a great distance to go nowhere at all. 
if you have the brevity, the if you're brave enough to, I think brevity is briefness. If you're brave enough <laughs> to move to pick your life up and move somewhere for a dream, get yourself into newer, better ruts in this new place. Chris fell into a psychiatrist habit that they call repetition of convulsion, which is an unconscious drive to repeat the horrors of the past. This is some Freudian shit. He's saying whatever happened in your past, you're recreating subconsciously. So if you were beaten and had an alcoholic parent, that's in your shadow. When you go out and drink too much because addiction is in your DNA, you're going to try to get into a fight. Strong vibes of you are your own worst enemy this chapter. Make friends with people who are best for you. So again, help yourself get around people who are going to drag you up. Unfortunately, in his 30s, Chris, the roommate had a psychotic break and committed suicide. So Jordan thinks it's mostly due to his low opinion of self-worth. A lot of people are in terrible, shitty situations on this earth. You don't kill yourself unless you hate yourself a certain degree. Fuck do I know. So maybe Jordan wanted better for Chris in the long run than his cousin, who was secretly looking for a good time. Like in uh, AA, they call it using buddies. Other people are catalysts for your drug use. Jordan's quote to end the chapter, when you dare aspire upward, you reveal the inadequacies of the present and the promises of the future. So if you're trying to be a go-getter, the potheads in your apartment are not going to like that. They're going to be like, bro, what, you think you're better than us? Come on, man, hit this shit. Make friends with people who want the best for you. Rule four, don't compare yourself to someone else today. Compare yourself to how you were yesterday. It's going to be a trippier chapter. And I'm fucking out of breath. Trippier chapter. Oh, if I do, I do, I do. 2020. It's your boy smoking some hempettes. This <laughs> sounded like a Rocky Mountain asshole. It's legal out here, baby. CBD, flour, totally non-psychoactive. There's 0.3%. There's no way you could suck all the trichomes off a of flour. There's these new cigarettes that they sell, and there's no carcinogens in them. I've looked up the ingredients online. It's hemp and CBD. You probably know somebody in your office who's taking CBD now. I don't know if you should be allowed to be in an office on this thing. It feels like um, if you've ever dipped, like a dip buzz, but it reduces inflammation, reduces anxiety, all that bullshit. We got some hemp bets going, ladies and gentlemen. So let's get a little trippy. Jordan says everyone has a different trajectory. Like before, not everybody's even. And he says some people have more than others what's called the revenge on being. (laughs) Little Nietzsche, it's toxic but useful. People are pissed that they're put in the situation they're in. The way to control this is your conscience. It's the voice in your head. It's the loudest voice for a reason. I'll tell you through anxiety (laughs) as I have to drag my CBD, Siggy. If you're not living up to your current potential... That's what anxiety is. If you didn't write as much as you wanted to and get on stage that night, you're not going to be tired out and you're going to be stressing about how you about all the things that you should have done. Anxiety, living in the future, whereas depression is living in the past. You're trying to relive old memories. Go make some new ones, homie. You ever hear of uh, Ram Dass? I think it is one of the big gurus nowadays. Be here now. We're trained throughout our lives to look through the next thing. First grade, second grade, third grade, middle school, high school, college, graduate school, get married, have a baby, retire and die. Be here now. Try to live in the fucking moment. We're humans. That's all we used to know how to do. We're super over inundated. Cut down that scream time for 2020. I'm not smoking hemp cigarettes <laughs> like a fruit for uh, my own pleasure. We're cutting back on the marijuana as well. Two episodes a month. I can't be watching as many Russian dash cam videos anymore. Let's get down to business. So it's hard enough to help someone, Jordan knew as a psychiatrist. Helping someone can be denying their own agency. You're saying, I have the authority to give you help. But it's also denying their agency from the past. It's like saying to someone, you weren't taking care of yourself enough a couple years ago. Now I have to step in for you. Most people won't realize that. They're just going to be like, oh, you're giving me help. There's a subconscious tone there a lot of people pick up on. So Jordan is saying you got to try to bring people to deal with their past self, not make it future somebody else's problem. It's like the AA thing I'll bring up again. I'm not in AA. (laughs) My roommate has one of those Bibles that I've been thumbing through a little bit. There's like life tips in there just like there is in this 12 Rules for Life book. The first step in recovery is apologize. You got to go make 
amends for your past. You don't have to ask somebody else for help. And that's what comparing yourself to someone else today rather than yourself in the past was. So let's address that quote that he started with, that revenge on being a little bit, <clears throat> because Jordan claims to be anti-nihilist, which is <laughs> like anti-negative in the way he debunks the entire ideology of nihilism. Nihilism is any idiot can choose a time frame in which nothing matters. Shrink it down enough. Oh, between 8 o'clock and 8.05, it doesn't matter if I do nothing. Well, if you say that every five minutes, then you're never going to do shit. And then if you zoom out enough, oh, we're all just beings floating through space, man. We're all just on a rock. We might be in a simulation, man. If you zoom out too much, nothing matters in that direction either. So you got to choose good games for yourself. He says there are certain games that your talent will match up to. It's, you see it in apps. Like, even scheduling. People are gamifying. Food, food you cate, Weight Watchers. It, give your food points. Now you're just playing a winnable game against yourself. And if you set these games up right against yourself, then you're going to be better than you were yesterday. And there is a physical reward system in our brain that has us do this. But all the caffeine, the nicotine, the non-psychoactive CBD <laughs> drowns that inner voice out and your reward system is completely different from someone else's so don't take like extremely specific tips in some motivation books it's going to be like on the third Wednesday only make your bed 35% to reduce OCD no just tell people to stand up tall these are more general tips that can help but look at like the vascular system from one human being to the next is completely different. Your veins are in a different place. This is why a nurse will stick you in the wrong spot and then you have a black and blue on your arm for three months. Why would anybody think that our neuropathy, the way our brains are wired, is exactly the same as the next person? Nobody's equal. I'm a fit tea model and I eat three crackers, one grape, and warm air from my hair dryer as a dessert. <laughs> That diet is not going to work for 95% of people. A lot of these motivation books don't work for a lot of people. You got to take the broad tips that expertise psychiatrists like Jordan are going to put through. Jordan bought up. He, he uh, branched out of the Bible a little bit here. The Hindu Vedic texts, Maya, the word Maya means blinded by desire as all people are. So you could take that a few ways. We're blinded by our physical desires by our five senses i want to eat a lot listen to good music and fuck or you could say maya people blinded by desires in the bigger sense if you dream too big you're gonna miss what's right in front of you jordan always says it's about taking the immediate best step that's available which might be putting the fork down a couple bites earlier than you're used to so jordan's final debunking of nihilism we're all animals we were all born into this shit we're all here Life doesn't have the problem you do. Get with the program. Think about it. This has been happening for millions upon millions of years. Literally survive and try to be the fittest or get offed. It's not going to change. So we end this Help Yourself chapter with a Gospel of Thomas story. It was about a blind guy who didn't even know that he was blind. <laughs> so Jordan says, Most people are not atheists in their actions, and your actions show your deepest beliefs. Church attendance is at an all-time low in American history. If they weren't tax-exempt, you'd see a lot of out-of-business signs on the front of parishes. It's your actions that show your deepest beliefs. So remember, everyone has a different notch of operating on a different processing board, so compare yourself to the latest version of yourself, the 2.019 version. Now your version, 2.020. Compare yourself to your last version, not the best version of somebody else doing their own thing because they were probably on your level at some point rule five do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them jordan is a parent so he loves writing about this shit he says parent versus friend should be in the forefront of every parent's mind the one that i've heard is you only get two parents and as many friends as you can make so being a parent isn't giving birth to a few new lifelong friends. You're signing up for the responsibility to be a mentor. The day that your spawn passes you in physical ability or intelligence, you sh that's not a happy day. You just got passed up. You're obsolete. <laughs>
Not only that, but nowadays kids can always find a new mentor with YouTube and all this shit. So the responsibility is even more on the parents than ever. Because it is an extension of yourself. You're responsible for the creature that you bought on this earth. You wanted to keep your sperm as a pet. I'm not paying for your child support, bitch. This is why I wear condoms. <laughs> don't try to be your kid's friend. They don't have to like you. It's about creating a competent adult. Teach them how to fish. Being a parent is an impossible job. Too many people just want to be liked. There's a misconception about what good parenting is. I'm the cool mom. I let kids get alcohol poisoning in my basement. It is pretty cool. <laughs> and a helpful Jordan parenting tip here. Pain is more potent than pleasure and anxiety more than hope. So motivation shouldn't be beatings and threats. It should be achievements and hope. Our brain responds better to that positive feedback loop we were talking about, whereas you'll put up a wall and go into a defense mechanism depression for years if you're being pushed via beatings or, uh, what were those called? Jail, solitary confinement, grounded, getting fucking grounded. You gotta want to reinforce good behavior. So you're not supposed to go up to the coffee counter when there's a giant line behind you and bend down to your five-year-old and go, Okay, sweetie, I'm going to get you. Do you want a cookie? I could get you a cookie. Mm, no. I could get you. I could get you a coffee. Motherfuckers be buying their five-year-old's coffees all the time. You are not supposed to baby your fucking kid. You're supposed to, at the earliest age possible... Push them in front of you and say, tell the man what you want. Jordan was saying this builds kids' confidence from an earlier age. They're going to be willing to take more risks at a later age. Otherwise, you are trapped in that Oedipus state, the perpetual state of waiting to be. On top of that, new parenting style you're hearing, minimum necessary force. You're not supposed to incite fear in your kids so they think the punisher, the enforcer, is coming home every night. And they fucking weep in their rooms with anxiety. Jordan said the most he ever needed to get a point across with his kids was a firm tug on the arm or a hold on the wrist. And his kids are all making six figures. So yeah, parenthood is not going to be fun. It's going to be hard to not let your kids do anything that makes you dislike them. Jordan said this is going to mean leaving a lot of restaurants and movies early. Kids do not have the attention span of an adult. Why are you taking them on an eight-hour flight or having them sit through the four-hour King Kong movie? You kept the ovum. If you can't afford first class, you are now ruining several hundred other people's vacation with a screaming infant. That is selfishness beyond fathom in my mind. I could not imagine. It's just such a total lack of self-awareness or just a fucking narcissism beyond belief that you think you and your infant are transcending <laughs> this communal experience of shitty travel. Fuck you. I remember the face of all the crying babies, so they better get their hands ready. 18 years from now, I'm going to fight them all. <laughs> One time on a plane, dude, this is like... If I was this kid's father, I would have jumped off the plane. Don't let your kids do anything that would make you hate them. I was trapped in the last row of a United flight by a father and a son in the window seat. Not a bad time, even though it was a five-year-old that was crying. Little too old to be crying there. I would give this motherfucker a swirly 5,000 feet in the air if I was his dad. And unfortunately, the five-year-old miniature human was not in the middle so that I could maybe sit up straight for a four-hour flight. The other 40-year-old full-scale man was cramping me into the, <laughs> the literal furthest corner of the airplane. Half an hour approaching descent, we had a little bit of turbulence. Motherfucker and motherfucker junior start to puke their guts up. So I am stuck elbow to elbow. Let your hostage out of the seat. It's like it's the, people have these disgusting little power trips where you, your life is that bad where you're going to torture me with your vomit. Thank you. Being a good person is more about making sure you like your kids rather than the kids liking you. It doesn't matter what they care about you. You want to hope that you bought a good organism onto this earth. Rule six, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. I was big on this one for a while. 
I think it's just because I have OCD. I fucking make my bed every morning. Girls come in my room and they're like, what is going on here? Like, what did you spend all day cleaning? What's going on here? Like, this is, I fucking live here. Am I wrong for vacuuming? Guys have fucked ourselves over so bad with having a bad rap for dirty rooms that now everybody with two X chromosomes that comes through thinks I'm a serial killer. Thanks. But who are you to try to reinvent society if you don't know how to fuck in the corners of your bed? Jordan started with the four means for escaping nihilism. <clears throat> this is what people do to not face the reality of the world. You retreat to childlike ignorance. There's mindless pleasures. You could drown yourself in booze or food. Weakness. You could just say, oh, I'm too weak. I need someone to take care of me. I need a provider. Or you could just be a dick and tell yourself life is evil. But life doesn't have to be suffering, we're learning through Jordan. Nihilism rejects value, and more importantly, meaning, which is what everybody's going to a friggin' uh, uh, psychology s therapy for. You're just being told there you have meaning in your life. Give your life meaning. Take it back. Take your fucking life in your own hands. Uh, we could get some Les Brown quotes in here. Live your life with passion. The human spirit is powerful. If you only knew the power of the dark side. Go listen to some corny motivation. Even that shit works sometimes. Nihilism rejects value, so you are giving up from the get-go. But a majority of us have an innate sense of good. We haven't all been deflowered or jaded since birth, but it happens to most people before they die. Jordan was talking about the set your house in perfect order thing in reference to the Jewish biblical rising and falling of societies. The Jewish religion views God as mostly good. This is why they keep moving. Jews were enslaved for longer than blacks ever were. And now, look at Hollywood, look at the Federal Reserve, look at the Washington Post or the New York Times. Look at those compositions, man. They're talking about they're the most woke publication. Meanwhile, they literally have three black employees and the rest are white Jewish people. I'm not one of these, like, Jews control the bank motherfuckers. But how is that an accurate uh, representation of society? You're telling us, you're telling every single McDonald's owners that they have to have a full palette of workers, whereas the people that inform our populace are legitimately one-sided. So the Jews, they set the point here. It's a good point. This entire culture was able to set its house in order. They stopped building pyramids for people, and now they have some of the biggest influence in the industries of America. We got to look at things objectively to do the underlying text for this chapter, setting your house in order. I'm not being racist or xenophobic or anti-Semitic. Look at more recent example, Hurricane Katrina. People were saying, this is an act of God. We upset God. What people don't see is that the government left a 60% unfinished levy for over 40 years. So they weren't using NOLA tax money to fix it. The sin of the government led to the flooding of innocent people and geriatrics dying. It's like the same thing when people go, thank God my surgery went well. You sure you want to thank God? How about you shake your fucking surgeon's hand? So if everyone actually did clean their own room, bit of a metaphor get your shit in line the world may not be as hellish of a place change starts from within rule seven pursue what is meaningful not what is expedient god said in the bible <laughs> quote from god by the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground you were taken from dust you are and to dust you will return this is sounding like a first testament very heavy hitting god quote there telling you you're going to be dirt eventually but pursue what is meaningful, not expedient. Once Adam and Eve became sentient, they were able to pass down stories. So you're going to eat, you're going to live, you're going to die. Believe something for the next generation, he's saying in that quote. And one of the biggest things in the Bible, <laughs> even if it is done through a, a, the myth of air, a lie, and through brainwashing every Sunday when you eat fake meat, I don't remember getting any protein, any gains from the body of Christ. It tasted an awful lot like carbs to me. We got together every Sunday to drink wine and eat carbs. What a religion. What Christianity does do is teach a delay of gratification. This is necessary to succeed anything in life. I think I identify as an independent now, but I'm most politically most aligned with the Libertarian Party, and one of their main pillars is the time preference. Sacrifice today for a greater tomorrow. 
like I say, I'm slaving away my 20s at open mics to try to be able to sling some jokes for a living. You would think um, most politicians would probably <laughs> understand the time preference, but y'all just heard that our uh, military spending was increased to, dog, I think it's $800 billion. And in the 2010s, it was down to $500 billion. So a 40% increase. Do you know what we could do with that $300 billion? You could clean up homelessness with 15%. I think the statistic is of that. And then with the rest of that money, you could send every single student in America to college. But no, without our say, our electorates just started to throw it into the military industrial complex. And our national debt is now at $4.7 trillion. So this is not a time preference. We are literally throwing our fucking greed, our debt onto our children. I just got, I mean, I've been into the working force not getting benefits from it for eight years now, but I just basically started society outside of college. Tell me how I myself contributed to the $4 trillion debt. I myself, 50% of Americans are in debt. I have money, nigga. Nibba. Oops. Like I said, though, our president's a freaking game show host, so of course all the politicians have a YOLO mentality. Live in the moment, you know? Lie, cheat, steal, deceive. Fuck our future. Obama saying let's bail out fucking Goldman Sachs for $8 billion. Takes us from two wars to seven. That is pursuing what is expedient. He made the biggest turnaround to Wall Street any president ever has. Literally, like, the week out of... um presidency he was on wall street giving Sachs a two hundred thousand dollar speech for half an hour has anybody ever made that much money in half an hour yeah people on wall street buying off politicians so yeah it's pretty messed up sucks to go to church on sundays but <laughs> now you have a value system whereas those lizard politicians were taken to the bohemian grove and done uh <laughs> black cube of saturn sacrifice worshiping every sunday at least you have some value and you're not willing to sell out your fellow man for an oil pipe. And he ended rule seven here, pursue what is meaningful, not expedient with the Jesus kissing the inquisitor story. It was like year 30 at this point. Jesus was a middle-aged man and he homoed everyone out in Jerusalem. A guy came up to Jesus in a crowd and was like, you saved my life a year ago. You healed me. And he kissed Jesus. He could have spat on this guy's face, but Jesus took it to the hole. He went all the way to the cross with that secret. Jesus wasn't like, fuck the gays. I need to go around all of Saudi Arabia and all of this peninsula talking about how that guy shouldn't have kissed me and he aggressed on me. I need to, <laughs> Jesus did not, me too. He kept his mouth shut like an adult. By year zero, Jesus Christ knew that slurring gays was not good for political rhetoric. Hillary Clinton, it wasn't in 2015 until she realized you have to let gay people get married. Look at who you're voting for. It's a presidential election year. So pursue what is meaningful. Don't vote for Bernie Sanders who's saying he's going to give you free college. It sounds expedient, but what does that mean? It means that your taxes are going to go up. And then you're going to have to pay the FAFSA back for your college education. Nothing's fucking free in America. Stop giving away your political leverage, our votes. Stop giving away my money. I don't want to be on your brainwash teams anymore. <laughs> While I am sounding... Like a complete outsider, I'm going to make it worse. I'm going to quote a concentration camp here. Jordan had it in his book here too. Abriet Mach Frey. You can be in the worst imaginable situation on this earth. You can be in a concentration camp. Abriet Mach Frey. Work will set you free. Work is a flow state. <laughs> I don't want to take that joke any further. But seriously, if you're in the biggest fucking depression of your life, start working towards something that is going to set you free. Meaning can be found anywhere in the depths of chaos or in the heights of order. But you cannot expedite meaning. Brings us to rule eight. Tell the truth or at least don't lie. He starts by saying omission of the truth is necessary for life. You can't go through life not telling every person who asks if they look good that they look good. Jordan said he had to lie to his patients as a psychiatrist all the time because, as I said before, the main goal of a psychologist is to try to convince your patient that they have a meaning. So Jordan said whenever, like, the higher degree that the patients were lying to themselves, the longer a process it's going to be. 
But hey, more money for him, he's thinking. Jordan's lies of omission took it pretty far. He was talking about how he once had a massive biker type of guy as his landlord. Name was Dennis. Dennis was pounding on Jordan's door every day with his bike helmet, demanding an advance on rent. Jordan got fed up with it one day, and he stood up to big old Dennis, and he was like, you told me you were trying to quit drinking, so this would be dangerous of me to give you the money early. And since he said it stern like that, Dennis was like, okay, man, thank you for looking out for me. So Jordan's let you know here, in this rule eight, you could definitely use words to manipulate the world. The world is your playground. It's not your fucking prison cell. Don't be so neat. So the less you lie to yourself, the more order there's going to be in your life. Many, many, many people are relying on Social Security for their retirement. And there's a lot of people going, I'm going to retire down to the Florida Keys in a bungalow with a margarita in my hand. That is a poster. That is not a plan. You got to write out very specifically, oddly specifically, creepily specifically what you want to achieve if you don't want to drown in delusion. It's that cleansing effect he keeps bringing up of organizing your thoughts. And it's not only telling your truth, it's living your truth. Like we said before, action is more important than words. So at least, at very least, don't live a lie. Because then you're sacrificing what could be for who you are. Which is that thing like, people are scared to write down goals because you know when you don't achieve it, you fucking failed yourself. Which is the hardest thing to look in the mirror and uh, come to terms with. It's cognitive dissonance. So even writing down your first goal, or when you write down a big goal that you even think is, wow, this one's a stretch, it's pushing you out of your comfort zone. Good. And so if people say, oh my god, I love adventure, but if you invite a girl on a date saying, let's drive around town, see if we run into some uh, fast food or some shit, <laughs> great date. Are they just saying they're adventurous, or do they actually want to have a different night this night of their life? And Jordan is saying, this is apparently huge in therapy, where it's like, you see girls putting up the meme, if he's in therapy, he's bae. Being therapy is the new being tall. It's because your therapist is your fucking teammate. They say, he's toxic, get away from this person. <laughs> and you see the new tweets, girls are fucking waking up, they're going, I'm not letting my boyfriend see a therapist because the therapist is going to let him know that I'm the toxic one. Book we're reading next month, The Game. It's all a fucking social game. And what you shouldn't do, knowing all this, is, um... You really shouldn't forgive people when they lie to you, he's trying to say. You definitely should, like, lie of omission, lie to their face, say, I forgive you, man, it's all good. But this is information for you for the future. You know this person, this is an act, this is something they do in their tool belt repetitively. Accept apologies and move on, know this is a person you can't trust. Because that person is lying to themselves, so you don't need that negativity bleeding into your life as well. And Jordan was saying with this apology thing, he had a buddy whose wife was cheating on him for a decade. And so instead of accepting the wife's apology, his buddy was like, no, bitch, good luck supporting three kids without any of my alimony. You just basically freed me from this marriage. And so he didn't accept her apology. His buddy went and climbed Mount Kilimanjaro with all the anger because that anger is definitely still going to be there, even though you're financially free. And Jordan was like... You could have just wallowed in your own misery for <laughs> being a decade-long cuck. Instead, you climbed one of the most notorious mountains on Earth. And so what was that quote last month by Plato? A man's desire, a man's worth is determined by the desires he aims to fulfill. Reoccurring theme this episode, you're depressed without any goals. This ties in exactly with the Nietzsche quote that Jordan has here. A man's worth is determined by how much truth he can tolerate so you're only as good as how much truth you're telling yourself if you're lying to yourself that doesn't you're not helping anybody you're definitely not helping yourself so compare yourself to yesterday it ties in with the fourth rule do you know more don't lie step on the scale are you skinnier are you where you want to be if you can articulate your personal truth to others it'll manifest just like the goals you write down put these things out there and work towards them Rule 9, assume the person you're listening to might know something you don't. Jordan's saying how psychotherapy is a genuine conversation of discovery. People think you're going to go into therapy and they're going to go, well, your dad beat you here, here, and here, and you need to do this, this, and this. <laughs> and then you have your big breakthrough, and then you go and achieve all your goals within the first five days of being out of therapy. 
what it really is is a discussion of discovery like uh you've heard of suppressed memories are a real last thing i was walking around my neighborhood here in denver the other day and they have these local libraries everywhere everybody's hippie everybody wants to <laughs> spread the information without putting their voice out there i like to take people's books from these and i got recently it's called word freak a book about scrabble and when i was looking at the cover i like pretty high started going back in time i was like holy shit in elementary school i was in a scrabble club i was the president of my fucking fifth grade class that's a pretty good story i was a co-president because the girl who i recruited the girl who i asked to be my girlfriend voted for the other bitch that ran against me <laughs> so there goes my power politics my fucking girlfriend didn't even vote for me and now i had to share the power with that power we created a Scrabble club, and I thought I remembered, like, I would have dreams, because I'm a fat ass, about a Scrabble cake. I remember there being this giant cake, and it looked exactly like a Scrabble board, and it was the best day ever. And I just thought it was some fleeting memory, some white whale, and I saw this book high as fuck, and I was like, Scrabble club! And I remembered that we had... We had, like, a tournament at the end of the year. People bought in desserts and shit, and that's why I'm a fucking word freak now, probably. Autist obsessed with wordsmithing. So what was that? Suppressed memories. Uh, like, psychotherapy is a, dis is a conversation of discussion. You can seriously unearth crazy things in your memory that you didn't even know were there when you're in the right place of mind. I looked like a fucking idiot, dude. I was standing there with a shit-eating grin on the side of the road in front of an, an apartment complex holding some stranger's book, which I now have. Take one, leave one. How about take one, leave an audio podcast of every nonfiction book you read? <laughs> There's a leave one. So assume that whatever conversation in whatever, uh, wherever you are, there's always something that can be learned. Jordan, as the psychiatrist, dealed with a lot of drunk people. And this was the scariest um, disorder because he dealt with potheads. He dealt with people who were seriously addicted to pills. And he was going, the scariest thing about the alcoholics is that they are very aware of the future. They just don't give a fuck. It's the white flag. It's the people giving up. Booze is going to be a perfect drug for that. And he saw with these people talking to them for hour-long sessions how easy it is to place a false memory in their brains. Meeting with all these alcoholics, these addicts, he saw these people felt taken care of by the drug. As soon as they were drunk, the anxiety went away. They felt like everything was going to be okay. And that's all anybody's looking for. That's all. That's why we buy these $1,000 rocks to put on people's fingers. People just want to be taken care of. I worked with a very flamboyant gay kid for a while, and he was talking all about... I'm just trying to find, like, an older man. Like, I've been looking on, like, TikTok. I've been looking everywhere. And I just... I just need a daddy. Like, I need someone that's taking care of me. <laughs> Even, like, this new generation of gay kids are looking to trap a man. They're not looking to have hot, sweaty mustache sex in a nightclub. Everybody's looking to trap a motherfucker now because of the working conditions in this country suck. <laughs> There's your male privilege. Aside from dealing with the alcoholics, Jordan had a lot of these campus studies, some cool ones, about how the girls on campus would come to him because he was like, he's still one of the favorite professors ever. Dude, I would watch this dude's lectures and I would sleep through some of my lectures. People trusted Jordan Peterson. He said he dealt with a lot of girls who would come to him with rape allegations. Jordan said alcohol was involved in every single case. He never had a case where this girl was like, I think I was raped were you drinking the answer is always yes there and therapy is a discussion of discovery jordan would ask defining questions like okay so walk me through the event this guy forcibly held you down and penetrated you against your will right and by the end of the conversation he said the girls always told him yeah i don't really think i was raped anymore i can't even laugh at that man it fucking scares me it ties in exactly to the last chapter about lying to yourself. If you're going to a frat party with your tits out, is that really empowering feminism? Or are you just tempting undeveloped testosterone machines? You're not being honest with yourself, and now you're blowing your personal lie up into a social extravaganza where a kid is potentially having his future taken away.
So yeah, thinking is pretty fucking hard, especially when you're doing it live in a therapy conversation with another person, but they're helping you to discover new things. The act of thinking is criticizing your own mental dialogue. It's very uncomfortable. I think that is the definition of cognitive dissonance. People, you just want to be at rest. But that's not thinking. You're cruising. It's like drunk people. They never listen to their own mental dialogue. Dude, we're like, dude, we're like, we should start a dude. Can you drive me home? That is drunk people. They're not even listening to themselves. Take the thinking power. Use your goddamn brain. Assume the person that you're listening to always might know something that you don't. Rule 10. Be precise in your speech. The word, like we said before, words are something to manipulate your environment with. If your car is stuck in a snowbank, it takes more than one man to get that out of the snowbank. Your words are going to be able to help you get your car out of that snowbank and convince other people to help you. Jordan says our capacity for identifying through someone else is insane. Humans are able to put themselves in other people's shoes more than obviously any other animals. But you could use this to your advantage by rhetoric. Like when you watch, they do all those types of college studies where you see like a sexy image pop up and then you get a boner. They test the endorphin levels in your brain go up because you're identifying with something you're seeing. We can live through the screen. VR is about to pop off. Jordan used some of the examples how sports fans, they did the study for the World Cup. The countries that lose their sex rates go down, their alcohol consumption goes down, their social levels and interactions go down when their sports teams lose. When you hold a gun or even just like a screwdriver they've done tests, your testosterone raises. We can identify through other things as people, and this can be used for rhetoric. Jordan found in his studies, another college one, you got a lot of people dating around, Immediately after breakups, due to empathy, men and women obviously handle it different, but right after the breakup, women's endorphin levels are higher than when they are in the relationship because they are getting all the empathy from their peers. Oh my God, text me, girl. Oh my God, let's go out tonight and get some dick. Oh my God, let me buy you some Ben and Jerry's and we'll cry all night. Women literally are happier after they get dumped rather than when they're being fucking taken care of because now they have a community supporting them. You are a toy! Empathy is a toxic, toxic drug. So one of Jordan's dating tips he said that girls loved that he would give them was be precise in your speech. The start of this chapter, if a fella on campus is only looking for sex, every single one of them, be precise in your speech with what you want. It's going to cut out anything that you're not looking for. Have some standards. Maybe you'll get hurt. No. Probably you'll get hurt, but that's what life is. Suffering, straight up. The quicker you learn to face rejection, the more you're going to grow and quicker. And so this be precise in your speech thing, this is why defining your goals is so goddamn important. Otherwise, you can hide within the language of your goals. Oh, well, I said I was going to make 10 podcasts this year. I didn't say I was going to me, me, me. <laughs> That's my inner bitch. He's just got some airtime for the first time. <laughs> That's my venom, but the, the pussy side. <laughs> if you don't define your goals down to a T of what you want to do, it's, shit is going to slip through the cracks. Jordan said here, the alternate to a single sharp pain of failure is the dull ache of continued hopelessness and the vague failure and sense that time is slipping by. I just got shivers up my spine when I hear the phrase time is slipping by. He's saying hopelessness is worse than doing something out of your comfort zone once and realizing you didn't like it or you did like it and you're pissed you didn't start earlier. Looks like I have another quote here that sums this one up even easier. I just watched Bojack Horseman. That was the first time I spent with Netflix in a minute. And it was, it's about like a fucking narcissistic anti-social actor who was like navigating Hollywood, which is the land of the freaks, Hunter S. Thompson called it. It's mentally ill people trying to <laughs> find out what's best for themselves. So basically America in a more condensed scale. And in that show, it's the same thing as this quote. He goes, yeah, because physical pain is so much worse than prolonged emotional distress. <laughs> Getting better at throwing my voice. We're going to be voice acting by season three. He's going, it doesn't fucking hurt that bad to get in a motorcycle accident. 
What really hurts is realizing how fucking mortal you are and how you haven't lived up to your potential already. Which is hard being 23 and telling myself that. That's why you feel like some of these fucking stories can kick your ass into an extra gear. And you need those extra gears throughout life. Another BoJack quote. Um, it doesn't get any easier, but you get better. It's true. Jordan ends this Rule 10 talking about dragons. Because dragons have been a giant piece of mythology throughout all of human history. I have this awesome deck of cards staring at me right now. It's a bicycle, the normal ass card company, but it has detailed dragons on every card. I'm, I don't even fucking watch Game of Thrones and I'm getting a chubby to these dragon playing cards. Dragons throughout history. Maybe this is a layered story. I love reading this type of shit. Dragons were something that could not be encountered by most men throughout history due to their fear. You had to go to the cave to sort out the dragon. Those who chose to lighten up the cave and walk into it half of them would see the dragon's overbearing hideousness and then sprint back out of the cave, but some would fight the dragon. Big allegory of the cave vibes. Jordan saying how dragons are internal and external in life. You gotta be honest with yourself and precise in your speech, that way your goals will help you slay the inner dragon. That fucking anxiety that's flying around your brain and <laughs> blowing fire onto everything, that dragon of anxiety you can put to sleep if you map out your plan and stick to it. And there's obviously dragons out there in real life. There's going to be obstacles that you have to overcome, promotions that you have to try to get. But what we want most, to keep the dragon analogy going, is deepest in the cave. It's in the darkest shadow behind the dragon. No dragon, no gold, baby. You gotta slay the motherfucker to get to the next point. Otherwise, he's probably gonna trap you in the cave. You're avoiding something. Jordan's saying random wandering throughout life might be adventurous and fun for a while, but it will not make you happy. It's going to raise your anxiety and frustration. Find your motherfucking dragons and slay that slimy bastard. Rule 11. Do not bother children when they are skateboarding. He gets a little more into the male versus female raising them, which we're having trouble nowadays. Five-year-olds can claim they're transsexual. And then the parents cut their dick off. Dude, <laughs> I don't I don't want to share this. I'm sharing it. We had this giant, like, uh, dress-up bin when I was a kid. Because I had older sisters, we'd put on plays and shit. So my favorite was the dinosaur costume, but I do remember there was a dress in there. And I did have the princess dress on from time to time. I would have been pissed if my parents identified me as a cross-dresser and cut my penis off. I probably would have killed myself from that. 50% post-op suicide rate from trannies. Keep that in the back of your mind. Now you know entirely too much about me, as you already did before. <laughs> I did skate as well here. This chapter rings fucking true. Skaters are not trying to be safe. That's what makes it so cool. You're launching yourself off of an incline at 20 miles an hour on four tiny wheels while your toothpick ankles have to try to land this trick. Skating is not trying to be safe. That's what makes it cool. You are trying to be competent, which is really as safe as you can be, as we learn today. Once you learn to fish, you can cook for yourself. Once you actually learn how to ollie, you're rolling your ankles a lot less. Bruh. So there is a massive risk in skating. I know buddies who broke their friggin' tibia and fibulas, but there's also a massive risk in life, who I know people who have gotten depression from life. Should we avoid life? No, don't avoid skating. It makes it builds you up. But not only that, skating is a community where people encourage you to try new tricks, which is the biggest thing. They're encouraging you to get out of your comfort zone. Dude, you're like ankles would itch when you were about to try a hard flip for the first time or some shit because you knew you were about to stomp down on the edge of a board. <laughs> but the community also reinforces you when you fail, which is just as big as telling you to try something new. And moms think that skating is just smoking weed. That's only 80% of it. There's really big community and personal growth that comes along with these activities. <laughs> That's an extreme sport. It's not an activity. Do not bother children when they are skateboarding. Jordan must have spent some time on the concrete surfboard. Jordan took his final shots out on Chris in this chapter, the stoner suicide guy. Back in their hometown in the tundra of Canada, some of the Canadian natives, 
used to beat up Chris because he was just like the epitome of white. He had my fucking curse, (laughs) blessing curse. And Chris internalized these beatings. He would come out to Jordan and be like, dude, I fucking, I feel so bad, dude. We took these people's land. I wish they'd beat me up again. And Jordan's like, dude, you are fucked. (laughs) You are messed up in the head. Have some (laughs) self-respect. So in this chapter, he bagged on Chris again, saying he had this smell of unemployables. It was on his sheets. It was on his clothes. And Jordan one time had a story published in Toronto. So him and his family were fucking going to like visit Chris and they visited him and he was like a time capsule. Like this guy hadn't changed an ounce, which isn't a good sign 20 years after college. And he thought the worst thing he noticed about Chris's situation and a lot of suicide cry for help people is their internal monologue. It's a sickness, so I'm not blaming fucking people. They're going, if they loved me, if just they loved me, everybody I knew actually loved me, they would know what to do. But this is just a voice of resentment. You got that nihilist brain virus going. You have to assume ignorance of people before malevolence. You can't assume that everybody wants the worst from you, you fucking schizophrenic. (laughs) You have to assume that people don't know what's happening in your life before you assume they want the worst for you. And this is one of Chris's fatal flaws, and it's probably a mental illness. And this shows a very high level of agreeableness, this mental repeating script of virus. I like to call it the greatest hits of your anxiety that you play in your head. These people are shown to be very high on the agreeableness scale. Chris is like, oh, I was in this apartment in college. Now I just have to act like this forever. Whereas guys who are not agreeable take fucking 80-hour work weeks, work on oil rigs where they could potentially die. Don't take time off. Don't take vacation. This is due to low agreeableness. And then women statistically are very high on the agreeable scale. So Jordan is saying Chris did not fall down he wasn't skateboarding he wasn't trying any new tricks he was just rotting away and making his brain patterns even worse by repeating the same tricks so culture we see is a survival mechanism like we were saying in the bible today these people pass on these cultures of the sabbath to protect each other and that's all culture is so what jbp learned through skateboarding and through all of his psychiatrists, the very large blanket of people that he dealt with, aggression isn't learned. It's natural. It's biological. Men have much more testosterone. They're going to want to punch shit a lot more and have to internalize a lot more emotions. So you really can't socialize a boy like a girl. They're not going to respond to the bubbly fake attitudes. It's probably going to heighten their aggression. So he ends this chapter saying male, female, non-binary, wolfkin, alien, whatever the fuck you are making people call you, you needy, amorphous blob. (laughs) Everybody can benefit by being told to toughen up. Let the skaters fall down and encourage your daughters to fall down too. Bold second to last rule. Rule 12 here. Pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. He starts out a very cute sounding chapter with a terrible thought experiment. If you could torture one child for a night to make sure suffering in humanity stops, would you do it? Psh, of course not. I couldn't spank a kid. Of course you would. If it was just one person that had to suffer, of course you would do it to save humanity. I mean, I would. I and mean, I guess I'm a psychopath for that. But Jordan is saying most people in this thought experiment would say no that's fucking ridiculous dude i would build like a um a shrine to this kid and be like everybody needs to praise this is the true messiah suffering stops when this kid was killed what are you talking about here you're gonna say no and jordan's argument off of that is that would god really create a world with all this suffering basically just pet the cat when you can it's a world full of shit take your small wins even in The Brother Karamazoo, that's by Dostoevsky. We should put that on the list maybe for later this year. That little story is about how a kid was locked in a freezing outhouse by his parents in the middle of winter in the middle of Siberian Russia. Are we sure his parents didn't want him dead? But the point of that story was he bought a little cat with him out in the outhouse. And what did they call him in? Kweka. That's how you say cat in Russian. One of the big themes in Dostoevsky and those Soviet Russia gulag hell on earth writings is that take your small wins, laugh when you can. 
or maybe God just has the best sense of humor of all time and laughs at other people's suffering. My clusterfuck of a life, you nailed it, God. Cats are a little bit different. Dogs, Jordan says, are happy and willing to be part of the family environment. They are willing to socialize in at the bottom of the family hierarchy for loyalty and love. That's the definition of being domesticated. And you could domesticate people, but the cool thing about cats and why Jordan favors them and is writing about them in his masterpiece best-selling book is that cats are predators, big cats, apex some of the biggest predators on earth they don't get eaten they are the best hunters the smartest animals aside from humans it's insane that this individual creature will interact with people on its own will most cats run away walk by start with a pss, 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 pss. try to get that little guy on your side and even if he doesn't if he runs away then you just learned a little tale about rejection for the day it's a win-win maybe you get to pet a cat So this little relationship we have of little killer who keeps our house clean from mice, it's a nice little manifestation of nature that lives alongside us. Jordan thinks they approve of man. So pet the cat. Enjoy the little things. Gratitude will add years to your life. This brings us to our coda, our big crescendo, big finish to end our first edition of the new year. Let's ask the big questions. Who? I gotta fucking bring the energy back. We always ramp it up towards the end of the episode for the newbies. I'm lighting up a hemp at. In your life, do you want it to have meaning? Because then you have to take on responsibility. You can have a fun life. You could go hostile hopping, banging pregnant chicks. You could do really bad things that I can tell you about not on this show. (laughs) But meaningless wandering will lead to anxiety and frustration map those goals out chaos has a lot of potential turn it into habitable order i'll be real with you here in the fucking coda this is the first year we're going to be building the show we're definitely dropping over 100 subscribers this year i'm going to be blasting this shit all over the internet this first year of life outside of college sucked dick and getting accustomed to knowing that everybody around you works a shitty job and that we're all just wage slaves was kind of fucking comforting Two years into the real world here. Everybody's in this shit situation. It could be niche if you let it, but you got to take it to the next step. It's the actions that you take with your spare time when you're not under your fucking master's reign that shows what you really desire. It's the actions. Bible quote Jordan has here. We're quoting Matthew from the Bible. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall open up to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Matthew 7, 7, 8. No one's going to know you need help if you don't. Don't be trapped in that Chris thinking, the kid who was fucking saying, everybody just needs to look at me. If you need help, ask for it, bro. You gotta accept your lowly lobster state. Don't lie to yourself. We're throwing all the fucking concepts together now. Embrace the lobster head, baby. Jordan ends the book with one of his uh, in-class, every class he would do this during the last lecture. He would say, I have given you guys a lot of information, more than probably any fucking other teacher will ever give you because they're all in this administration propaganda agenda. Jordan, that's why he got kicked out of University of Toronto. He was going off... Uh, script what is it called curriculum administration doesn't want that his assignment was he would tell people you have all this fucking forbidden knowledge now you have a pen of light use your words to change the world what are you gonna write with your pen of light first kid up with my pen of light i will write the words that i want inscribed in my soul (laughs) this kid is definitely going a little too big picture with this assignment it's a poetic answer but just like these Socrates definitions, we got to make it more precise. What, what was one of the rules? Be precise with your speech. The next student wrote a very specific question. What should I do with the fact of aging? <laughs> he put all of his existential weight on Jordan with this one question. And Jordan actually took this assignment home and wrote a little essay for his student. This guy cared about helping people. He's not there for a paycheck. He said, replace the potential of your youth with the accomplishments of your maturity so have something to show for the older you get start working towards shit he was the best professor ever 
This is why today he's doing lectures in stadiums. Has anybody ever done that? This guy might be a fucking... Holy shit. That's genius. He, like, invented his own lane. That's fucking crazy. And the best answer that a kid had, Jordan, was saying, be the most reliable one at your father's funeral. And Jordan was like, I'm using that. I'm using that in my world tour. I'm using your pen of light answer in a stadium full of open minds. Pretty fucking dope. Everyone will say life is hard. So when it's going well, just try to embrace those good moments. Because they're few and far between. Probably the older you get. (laughs) Have fun. Jordan says, write what you can now. Write how you're going to be better next year. Then the year after that. And the year after that. Practice excellence. Jordan hopes this ancient wisdom mixed with some of his own is enough to have helped you all figure out something about yourselves. Thank you guys for being open-minded and staying tuned for Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. And now you have something in common with people overseas. You just say, ah, oh, ni hao, you know Jordan B. Peterson? And you're going to have something in common with millions of people from another country. It's a good book. I definitely suggest to pick it up. Even if you're not religious, look who you're talking to. Awesome stuff getting us on the right foot for 2020. I am very obviously fired up. It's going to be a good year for all of us here. Thank you guys for tuning in for Nick's Nonfiction with Nick Muniz. And for the first time ever, we have our shortest hiatus between episodes. On the 15th of January, in a measly two weeks, I am dropping our first fiction book replay by Ken Grimwood. This is a book recommended by Stephen King. It is a trip and a half that I will be taking you on about reincarnation, time travel, and a big old love affair. It's a fiction book, so this is going to be some heavy romance going down. Ladies, holla! Romantic comedy right here, Nick's Nonfiction. You got it all. Our first book of February is going to be probably one of my favorite shows it was one of my favorite reads so definitely uh, if you're just going to be doing our main episodes first of the month it's going to be right where you know it is as always check out our new video it's going to be a fun time i'm going to be doing a little more off the dome it's going to be like a a little bit of a freestyle because i try to put some jokes together for these shows that can't be two hours of (laughs) of a lecture this is entertaining shit we got some really cool concepts with ken grimwood's replay for the 15th of this month I'm looking forward to that. I hope you guys are too. Get out there. Start making this year your bitch. And I'll see you guys in a fortnight in just two weeks. Love y'all. See you then. Peace.